Hi, this is Keith Norby. We're kicking off the VMware Virtual Volumes uh, Roundtable webinar. I'm live at the Oklahoma City VMUG, and I'm presenting to a group full of uh, enthusiastic virtualization people. If you guys uh, want to comment online, we've got a chat window. We've also got some questions in the room that we'll be taking uh, throughout, the we throughout the webinar. We've got a very special panel of people. If we can advance to the next slide. Um, so we're, we want you to brace your addiction. So everyone in the room here, if you guys want to be on your screens for the webinar, that's great. Uh, if not, we've got two great, beautiful, big screens here. And everyone uh, on the webinar remotely, you, you obviously are seeing this live. Go to the next screen. Next screen, please. Um, back one, sorry. So rules. Questions are awesome. No matter if you're here or if you're there, uh, questions throughout is great. Either put them in the chat window, we've got people monitoring those, uh, or if you have questions here, we love that. Uh, if you also are on Twitter, uh, hashtag is fueled by SF, hashtag VVOL's webinar, and you know, just tweet away. Make comments if you think this is cool. If you think there's uh, something that you have a question, you can obviously pose it there, but tweet away and be crazy. We also have some uh, finger rockets in, in the room here, so go crazy with those later, not now, um, and have some fun. Next slide. So on our panel today, we have uh, some of the world's best Devolves experts. Um, I myself am a senior business development manager for Solid Fire. I manage the VMware relationship. Uh, my Twitter handle is on there. Uh, I've also got four other people that I'd like to have uh, jump in uh, at, at, when we get to the sections here, but I'll introduce them for, for us, uh, for the people that are on the webinar. First of all is uh, my teammate, Josh Atwell. He's a cloud architect. You know him from a lot of different podcasts and community events, uh, big time into automation, and he's one of the core experts that I work with in the team, and uh, he'll be on the webinar today talking all about D-Balls. We also have Andy Banta. Um, now, and he's one of those legendary figures within the VMware community. Uh, he was one of the guys that helped create the, one of the uh, the ISW driver for ESX. And he's on our team on Dev, and we'll have him uh, talk a little more specifically about his background in a second. Uh, Rollinson Rivera, a lot of folks know Rollinson, very well known worldwide. Um, he's on the tech marketing team. He's a principal architect in the storage and availability group. Uh, he's got a very well known Twitter account called At Punching Clouds. He also has his blog at punchingclouds.com. Uh, punch and then last but not least is Ken Wernerberg from VMware. He's a senior architect. He's also a deep expert on VVOLs. And this is our panel to start team. Um, with that, uh, if maybe Josh, you want to just take a, a couple more minutes, add any color to your background, as well as Andy, Rollinson, or Ken. Sure. Um, jo as uh, Keith mentioned, I'm Josh Atwell. Um, my, you know, I, I would, I guess, I'd like to point out that my my big interest in VVOLs, as you're going to see during this discussion, um, being an automation and management person, um, VVOLs is a, is going to be uh, an interesting transition for folks. So um, I'm very ingrained in in what the technology is going to enable and how it's going to be utilized. So I'm looking forward to this discussion, and um, that's going to be kind of my angle on most of the VVOLs discussion. Hey, uh, I'm Andy Banta. Uh, started Solar Fire not too long ago, and I'm doing uh, work on development work on Devolves here. Uh, as Keith mentioned, my background is uh, at the end where I did an awful lot of work on the ISW subsystem there and uh, watched Devolves in its very early stages at VMware before moving on. Uh, my name is Rawlinson. I love long walks on the beach on Sundays, and I uh, do some of the things that uh, Andy likes to do whenever Howard tells me to do them. Does that include previous and, meeting? Uh, I'm Ken Wernerberg. I uh, like to carry Rollins in the bag and he's walking on the beach in the sunset, uh, doing things for other people. <laughs> That's us. Excellent. All right, next slide. 
All right, so our agenda today, we've got, we're, uh, we'll be covering what VVOLs are, uh, why, why you might care about those things, uh, a storage-based policy management and VVOLs type discussion. Uh, we'll next move into the architecture changes with VVOLs, as well as how are VVOLs consumed, and then solid fire and VVOLs. And that is just basically to show you what we're, what we're planning to release and what are some of the uh, architectural comparisons. And then, of and course, just Q&A just Q &A just Q &A throughout. And just for anybody who's, who's interested, uh, that's uh, Donaldson and Josh in the top, and me and Ken in the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one, square um, headed German. So, um, if we go to the next slide, uh, we got topic number one what are VVOLs and why care? Um, there's a bunch of things to get into here, but ultimately, the two big themes we're trying to drive for are the changes in the operational models and the ultimately greater control that you get as an admin, no matter which profile you're trying to achieve. Uh, next slide. All right, so changes in operational models. This is a lot to look at. Um, Josh, maybe why don't you give us a, a walkthrough of, of uh, some of the comments you want to start making towards this change in operational model, and then as the other panelists want to jump in uh, and comment, we'll cover this, and then we'll go to the next uh, slide. Sure. Uh, you know, from, from an operations standpoint, uh, traditionally, you know, organizations have been very limited in, to, in what they've been able to provide up to the virtual layer to, in, in respect to storage for the virtual machine workloads. Uh, you know, those, those policies have tended to be um, very directed towards your, your precious metals, where they would dedicate specific types of resources on a storage system, um, carve those up, present them up as ones, and it was an all-or-nothing type of model, right? Which meant that in order to make changes or to adjust based on the, the changing needs of the application or the changing needs of the, the business that was leveraging the, the hardware, you know, they, they were very, very limited as to, to how they would provision that out, how it would be, a, be able to be consumed, and you know, what they would have to do to, in order to uh, adapt to the changing needs. Um, and then, you know, from, from an architecture standpoint, you know, uh, I, I think I'll let Rawlinson really get into the things that VMware has done um, with virtual volumes to enable us to move past being very locked into what has been traditionally a, um, a very static uh, operating model. got to love that mute button. It gets you every time. Rollinson, you with us, buddy? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Sounds Oops. like we had an audio Oops. clip there. Oops, my bad. So, yeah, I, I tend to be 100% uh, agreement with what you were saying, Josh. Obviously, my... My main focus or my or one of the values that are the most interesting to me about this new framework is is the operating model and the efficiencies that it delivers beyond the technology. Uh, I think uh, when we talk about storage or storage or storage, uh, those things are delivered in many flavors. Uh, but the granular control is one thing, and then another is being able to simplify uh, the complexity in storage. And we need to now start consuming storage. The same one we started doing with uh, compute, <clears throat> and it has to become that uh, at, at that level of, of simplification in order for us to be efficient, uh, while still you know the the storage infrastructure still be able to deliver its value and the goods and everything that it does, but in a much simpler, more efficient way. Yeah, if I can jump in on that one too, it's Ken. Um, I, I think one of the big things here when we talk about VVOLs, everyone always says, so so what is it? We start talking about faster providers and protocol endpoints and uh, all the rest of these things that we will talk about and lend free operational management and things like that. But I think to me the, the biggest change is absolutely the change in behavior in terms of how VI admins interact with storage and it all comes down to this per VM and policy driven stuff. So this framework helps deliver a new operational model where people can have policy driven per VM policies which you know if that happens on a a, a LUN-free environment with a storage container or with one VASA provider sitting on a 
uh, a data store. Who cares? So th those are the implementation details that make it an amazing framework. But it's that change to per VM policy driven storage that that really is is the benefit of something like Feedfalls. Yeah, and if, uh, I'd like to add that you know some of the basic reasons for coming up with Feedfalls is uh, with block storage storage vendors were complaining that they actually had no visibility about what the objects were that they were managing, that it was just a, a big blob file system and there was no idea of what was actually laid out on it. Um, and, and part of the other pieces that you get on the per policy or per VM policies are uh, basically a replacement for a uh, storage dynamic resource uh, um, system where uh, previously if you need to give different uh, properties or characteristics to a, a VM, you would often need the ESX side to migrate it to a different uh, storage device and, and that would you know basically slow it down or, or you know chew up your sand bandwidth to, to make that move. Uh, with VVOLs you don't even need to do that. You can just change the policy of each object uh, at any given time and uh, you, you don't need to go through the process of having ESX migrate something from one place to another. And that's a pretty huge change. I mean, a lot of people don't um, haven't really fully grasped that. And I think we're so, like I said, talking a lot about technology as a whole in the industry when we're talking about things like VVOLs and, and so forth. And obviously, it is a technological implementation, but uh, it's that change in the mindset of the consumer it, that I think still needs to happen uh, before. Yeah, and I think there's, all, there's been an awful lot of talk about what VVOLs is and you know what the implementation is without ever really going to the justification of why VMware thought it was a good idea and what the advantages were to it. So uh, just the, the ability to actually have storage, understand what's being stored rather than you know just having a file system on it is uh, one of the big motivations. Well here, yeah. here's one angle here's one angle that I always that I always sort of discuss on this topic. It's you know we as technologists tend to focus very deep on, 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 on configuration specs and what can be done. But let's be 100% real about this. Everything that's been, that's been done and that, that everyone has in terms of storage features and capabilities, uh, everyone can do them in some way, shape, or form. Why do we think that it would be beneficial to deliver a framework which enhanced the way in which storage is consumed, managed, and operated? Implementation details are something else. Um, obviously, that's what us technical people tend to deal with. The challenge here is not the technology because, number one, it's the same technology delivered much more efficiently in a, in a fashion that is dynamic and that it fits the software-defined data center model. The deal is that we are changing people process. We are reducing risks. Uh, and by doing so, we are delivering agility of infrastructures to the storage layer which was not there before. That translates into many layers of efficiencies from operations, which leads to performance, which leads to service levels being able to be satisfied. And, and let's just take out the whole, you know, the whole technology piece out of it. Let's just, you know, if you, if you point out what actually are we really uh, sort of reducing and, and simplifying. So when you think about, if you look at this uh, diagram here. Think about all the things that a storage architect has to do to sustain and maintain the demands of a, of a virtualization admin. I need X number of lungs. I need X number of lungs that can do this. I need to move from here to there. Um, all of those processes are manual, humanly driven, and even though we have technology that kind of drives, uh, addresses some of the contention mitigation strategies that we have, DRS, or CRS, and all these things, uh, there's still that human factor that we have to click in, and every time we put that in place, uh, there's a risk, uh, a risk of violating a service level, a risk of you know, an enterprise software, some sort of outage, exactly like what Andy said, moving things around. You know, we can move things around, but that's not always necessarily a, a good thing because obviously uh, there, there's pros and cons to all of that, and, and we have to live with them. The deal is that uh, being able to mitigate and fix these people process, how many people have to be involved to make a decision on doing something, it's very powerful. But it's also a huge challenge because now we have to the change introduced here. The biggest the biggest part here is not the technology. The technology plays a great part in this because we have a this control plane and this management plane. 
But the big deal here is the education, the, the change in operation, the change in how customers will consume that and operate an infrastructure, which is not to what they're accustomed to. We have individual silos to do different things and manually driven. Now this framework introduces a level of automation and, and that's driven by the system with a two-way communication where now not only the storage system tells you what it has to offer, but now from the vSphere perspective, an application admin, a vSphere admin can say what it wants to consume from that. Uh, yeah, and normally, right. yeah. and normally that's something that's uh, you know, done uh, by people different in time and stuff like that. And that's great. That's the beauty great. of the whole model here. Is that? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, great, great point, guys. And uh, just for the sake of time, uh, so we can get through all the the uh, touch points we've got to hit on the topics. Um, let's go to the next slide and, and continue the conversation. This is my favorite. I'll take this one. So we are in the business of managing loans, um, and I don't know. You know, obviously, to, to the point that I was saying before, you know, you create multiple loans to do multiple things, but Andy, you know, you've got a lot of experience in this world doing this stuff. Tell me how, you know, how, how does that sort of, uh, uh, how, do you, how, does that, how is this an obvious issue for, uh, for, for customers in, in storage infrastructures and, and the way that the world moves today? Well, I mean, I think we already touched on that a little bit. One of the biggest issues is that if you want to change, you know, where, some, where storage is located or, or the service level of it, uh, probably something that's even more valuable than the SX CPU uh, is your, your storage network bandwidth. And if you're actually spending an awful lot of time moving your data around without your clients actually consuming the data, you're mm -hmm. you're wasting one probably one of the most valuable resources in your data center, which is your storage network bandwidth. Uh, so uh, the the idea is that you can if you can actually manage the object at the storage level rather than the ESX level, you're saving an awful lot of uh, of that resource, and you also get away from the idea that you have uh, a LUN, an LU, which is a big storage pool which can contain a bunch of different stuff. If you split it up and just say each item contains only one piece of, you, of you know, interesting VM information and you can treat it separately, uh, you, you don't end up with uh, you know, over-provisioning of storage. Uh, you probably don't need to over-provision your storage network as much anymore, and you're uh, certainly taking CPU time on your ESX servers on your vSphere uh, cluster. Yeah, and then also, you know, when you're when you're dealing with large infrastructures moving this way, you know, there's a huge there's a I don't want to say a problem, but there's something that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, you know, the, the framework can only do so much uh, in terms of how many of these things can come around. So maybe can you know, what, what's our take on the whole LUN thing and, and some of the limitations that exist dealing with that? Well, I was talking to a customer earlier today, and, you know, the conversation steered over to, to VVols, and I, I asked them to point out, I'm like, so what's your interest in VVols? And, you know, it, it's interesting because they, they hit on a lot of the things that we're talking about here. Um, one, LUN, LUN mapping and, you know, getting all the fiber channel zoning right to introduce new LUNs because the data stores, you know, they set their data stores into storage clusters, and when they hit 80%, they don't want it to, you know, to provision onto that data store anymore and to maintain space for snapshotting. You know, and so what they're continuously having to do is deploy out new data stores, which involves manual process of, you know, creating the LUN, getting the LUNs mapped to the correct SXI host, and getting those out. Whereas with VVOLs, you know, as they grow, their storage container is using the protocol endpoints. It's connected. It's already there. You know that 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 effort is no longer um, you know a requirement in in how they're you know growing their data center and, and consuming their storage. And you know for them that was you know certainly a, a critical component of of what VVOLs was offering from you know being able to you know to what this slide is saying, right? Being able to deliver those resources. Um, more quickly and more efficiently. Yep. Next yeah. slide. Yeah. I think, by the way, how Mark's actually win the prize for making the Keith Moon reference first. <laughs> I feel like we need some drum rolls to go with it. <laughs> yeah, I think just to kind of wrap up my thoughts on this one as well, I, I think the problem has been that LUNs really have acted in three different capacities in the past, right? It, 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 it acts as the endpoint for the data. It acts as the 
capacity boundary for how much you can put into it, and it will the capabilities of the array up into it. So we're putting, we're trying to balance three different requirements of a LUN. With VVOLs, what we're doing is saying let's break all of those things apart and treat them independently. As Andy was saying, the fact that the array is now aware of what the VM is gives us the ability to dynamically allocate things like array capabilities to it independently of the capacity, independently of the, 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 the data path. So it's kind of uh, breaking apart traditional functions that gives us a lot more flexibility to not have to worry about managing all of these things in one particular location. And that's what enables things like, again, that per VM policy that frees up the storage uh, vSphere administrator from having to understand the entire stack and all of those capabilities of every line, every data store, and all the rest of it. Yeah, and, and just to actually address something that's on the slide here, uh, it, it mentions providing per VM granularity. It goes deeper than that. You actually can provide granularity at the VMDK level. So even if you have a VM with multiple VMDKs, if they, those need different uh, service levels, you can even go to granularity. You can go to granularity that much farther. All right. That's probably a good place to break into the next topic. Um, and that is storage-based policy management in VVOLs. Uh, in here, you know, the big thing we're trying to address and, um, and look at is the opportunity for admin roles. And the reason why we talk about this is that, you know, storage isn't just managed in a vacuum. In this day and age, you have um, application builders, VM admins, and storage. And in particular, VVOL has given us a great opportunity to be able to address really the two key personas in here um, and also give us a chance to address the automation. So as we get into that, maybe if the, if the panel could talk a little bit to, you know, what's the difference in the roles? What's important to the storage admin? What do they get out of evolves versus what does the VI admin get out of evolves? And take us through that. Oh, sure. Let's see. Um, so when it comes to obviously the, the communication process here is what's key and. and now that these virtual volumes, which again, we talk about virtual volumes, but for those of you that are new and don't know, virtual volumes is just the native representation of a VMDK on the array, where the array now consumes that natively. There's no VMFS in the middle. So the, the point of all that is that we have a common way of communicating with the storage uh, admins now. Uh, to us, we also always look like what they are, VMDK files within the infrastructure. Uh, we can still uh, provide, you know, easy uh, consumption of demand and all that stuff, but now the the storage admin is able to actually manage and monitor performance per object as it's needed and required um, by a particular uh, virtual machine and in a particular service level. Um, the access control and security is still on the on the vSphere admin. I'm sorry, on the storage admin. So the storage admin uh, basically is able to offload um, a lot of some, some of the things that it has to do on a day-to-day -day basis when it comes to you know cost, continuously having to meet requ uh, demands for LUN creation, um, uh, but you know, it's not just give me a LUN, give me capacity. It's give me this particular configuration because this application needs to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. now they're able to basically uh, serve up a, a the form of an a la carte menu, so that then now at that point in time, the the VSphere admin, the VI admin can, can consume that. So it simplifies the, the, the what half what the storage admin has to do, uh, but still, you know, at least a lot of the things much that are, that's in control. Which one of the things that when it comes to offloading uh, responsibilities and being able to understand uh, these things, the one thing that, it, it, it's, that needs to be known when it comes to storage infrastructures, um, you know, the storage architects, the storage admins are the ones that have to worry about whether you know, a potential outage puts a company, you know, a storage outage puts a company, uh, it, 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 it's an outage for X period of time, or do you put the company out of business? I learned that from Howard Marks, by the way. Um, and it's very true. Uh, this is something that they, they, when it comes to offloading, being able to understand what, it, what the vSphere guy is doing compared to what I have to control down at the, at the storage level. Uh, now things are somewhat different, but they can be now understood because now these components are now natively uh, res native residents of, of the storage array, and that kind of uh, makes the whole conversation and the whole management piece a lot better. So each person gets exactly the input that they need out of the environment. The VI admin doesn't have to understand the full stack and all the rest of that stuff. They just understand SLAs, policies, the rest of those things, and the location and positioning on an array with an LVA or whatever. They don't have to know any of that stuff anymore. Right. 
storage and then next slide. You'll have the response. Yeah, next slide. Yeah. Go to the next slide. Shows good good representation of that. And here it's that approach, right? A lot of folks that may have may or may not have experience looking at virtual volumes, you as a storage admin, uh, you as a VSR admin. So your role still remains. The same things you've been doing uh, in terms from a managing and configuration aspect. You know, you have the storage admin goes through their own UI. They have the ability of creating a storage container, which is on the array itself. A container basically um, allows you to allocate capacity and, and, and features and things that are on the array, storage capability. Uh, from a vSphere admin perspective, the vSphere admin goes through the, the vSphere web client. You know, we mount a data store, which mounts, which is a, a logical mapping again to the uh, to the uh, storage container. Uh, they have access to the storage policies, which are created based upon what the uh, array system is advertising and what the storage admin has added to that particular container. Once that's done, you know, we deploy VMs, we assign policies. Now, when these VMs are going to be deployed, they're basically uh, offloaded down to the array, and the array now creates these virtual volumes. Now, uh, and now the uh, the storage admin will see at, at its level, at, at the storage layer, virtual volumes, you know, the representation of these VVOLs, whereas um, in vSphere, that will still remain, uh, you know, files and things as, we, as we've been able to see them for a long time. But the efficiency here is that I don't have to worry about putting you know, one VNDK on LUN20 because LUN20 gives me uh, snapshots and then LUN45, which is almost full, gives me uh, encryption and, and whatever else features you have. You basically offload that to this management framework, which basically does the initial placement based on what it knows, and the storage systems will manage that and will handle it uh, in its native form. Yeah, and one of the important points that you, you just touched on that you, we should probably say point out in more detail is that the view for the, the vSphere admin doesn't change from what they currently see. So they still see data stores, they still see directories in their data stores which contain VMs and all of the configuration files and all the VMDKs for VMs. So their view doesn't change. Uh, it's just the way that it's actually implemented underneath that changes. Well one point I'd make on you know the v view from the VMware administrator is you know, now when you implement using you know, storage policies that you know, are defined based on the capabilities of, of the system, you know, when the virtual machines are deployed to those policies, you, know, you can actually you know, maintain and understand compliance of those policies and understand that you, know, you can look and see that the virtual machine is residing um, with VVOLs that are attached to the correct policy so that if you know, you get a, a consumer that has an application. And they're saying that they're they're getting terrible performance all of a sudden. And you look, and that they're on the wrong policy. You know, that that compliance is is now you know native and part of part of the management, uh, and it's right there when you look at the summary view of the virtual machine. Right, uh, and I mean one of the things that changes from the current VMFS model is that that policy is no longer tied to the VMFS or in this case the storage container. So those policies are actually at the, the per VVOL and not per storage container. So the storage container is just a logical collection of your your uh, virtual machines and VVOLs, but the policy is not based on what the storage container is. Next. All right, storage capabilities and VM policies. Uh, as we move through all the personas, um, the capabilities of the dual personas that we've talked through, and some of the capabilities of the arrays. You know, this is really where this where the rubber meets the road. And I think you have a real extensible capability to do something profound with VVOLs. This is where capabilities, not just of the underlying system, can really have advantages, but you can really understand how to use what you have in your infrastructure. Um, whether you use solid fire or not, this is the opportunity in VVOLs to be able to understand what your, uh, your, your uh, VVOLs provider is going to give you, as well as what your non-VVOLs providers can give you. Maybe Josh, if you can walk us through from a storage policies perspective, um, you know, where capabilities take us, and then if the rest of the panel can kind of take us from there and, and lay on some extra details, um, that'd be great. 
Yeah, so you know, call it, so the capabilities on a virtual volume are reported up from the storage system, right? So the, the storage provider, like SolidFire, is able to identify, you know, using their VASA provider, the capabilities that the underlying you know, storage is capable of providing, you know, whether that's uh, encryption, whether that's replication, which as uh, Shay in the comments pointed out, you know, isn't, um, supported on the array level in version 1.0, but vSphere replication is supported. So there, there is kind of a tie-in, um, and there is a roadmap in the future to where naturally those types of technologies are going to be there. Um, so the, the development and you know, displaying those capabilities up um, are really important because those capabilities, whether it is like an I QoS profile like SolidFire provides, um, whether replication will be enabled, encryption, and things like that, those are actually consumed through the storage policy-based management framework in order to create the policies that are then made available to the, to the VMware administrators. And this is providing, VMware is doing a great job of providing a great deal of you know, capability to storage providers to you know, you know, serve up and say, hey, this is who we are, this is what we're capable of, you know, this is what our, you know, our storage can deliver you know, to the consumer and be able to make those policies so that the consumer can make informed and conscientious decisions about the needs of their application. You know, getting that control that uh, I'm pretty confident we all agree that they've yearned for. Yeah, let me, let me just kind of let me just kind of briefly because we have such a large audience here, let me just take a stab at this real quick. So there, obviously the, one of the biggest things in talks around capabilities and what's exposed today comes around the whole replication piece. And I think we've answered plenty there, uh, how it's supported, how it's not supported today, how it's coming in the next release. Um, but let me say this. Uh, a vendor can actually deliver replication from its array solution. It's come on working on that. Uh, what happens here is this. it's important for folks to understand this. Uh, the goal is to have the capabilities exposed through the management framework so that you can selectively, through the policy per object, choose whether or not you want to replicate that specific component. Um, there is the chance for a vendor, because they have replication as part of their array, their system, their solution, to actually potentially enter, enable that capability uh, on their own, on their side, right? And this is what becomes what, what we identified as an unmanaged uh, operation. Uh, and uh, what they actually have, to, what has to happen here is this: a, 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 an SRA today doesn't talk to a VASA provider. So that's how everything works in VWOLs, right? But if they can make the changes that, uh, for example, the SRN product and RN does when it comes to going from one site to another, which ones to reach ones the right. Uh, and they can circumvent what we would have to do because since the framework from iron doesn't touch it, uh, that's something that can be put towards the VMware and, and, our, and the engineering and the product people can get together, which we have done this already for some vendors, and look at whether or not that's a, that could be a supported configuration. But that support will come from the array vendor. And, and Ken here, you can add some magic because you're the uh, SRN king um, and explain maybe why you know why some of these some of these things could potentially be overcome or, or, or maybe maybe not. Well, yeah, I mean it's. So SRM requires obviously some form of replication. VSphere replication works, but the array base is traditional where it's come from. Now, when you move a, uh, an active environment, let's call it from one array to another if it's been replicated, then obviously there's a whole bunch that needs to change. The metadata about all the VMs changes. We, we want to resignature the disks as part of the failover. Um, but under VVOLT, it's a different world because we have these new constructs. We have things like container IDs and, uh, and all the rest of those components that are not necessarily um, built with the SRA for Site Recovery Manager spec in mind. So oh, it, it's untrod territory for a lot of people. So we're looking at ways that we can, first of all, standardize that type of a call and expose it through SPBM so that SRM can then pivot around and start using storage policy-based management rather than it's sort of, let's call it direct access to the arrays that it does today. And secondly, be able to expose that in a common framework through VASA. Uh, and then thirdly, have our partners implement that and do the above. So there are a lot of changes that need to take place, but of course that's all underway. But I think we're, we may be getting really deep on the, on the replication side here when we're really talking about a whole bunch of different capabilities that are kind of 
across more than just that. I mean, we're talking about any sort of capability of the array, whether it's you know, fast clone offloading on the array, whether it's something like snapshot, whether it's DD compression, quality of service, all the rest of these capabilities can now be exposed directly from the array to individual VMs. And yes, replication and DR is going to be one of those capabilities. But uh, if you look through the, the programming guide for VLs, there are, I mean, dozens and dozens of types of capabilities that uh, vendors might want to use if their VMware specified or use their own capabilities and publish them through the same FAST provider. So the point is that uh, it's an evolving spec. Replication's in there. It's one of them uh, that is not exposed yet, but obviously will be. But there are just tons and tons of, of additional value capabilities that, that the arrays have that can be exposed through SPBM and thereby used on a per VM policy basis. Yeah, one thing I'll point out from uh, from an operations and management perspective, right? This is extremely useful to the administrator and the consumer because as the you know as Vvault continues to mature and storage providers continue to present up more and more of their capabilities, the operating framework that you transition to with storage policy based management does not change, right? All that fundamentally changes is that as new features and new capabilities are introduced, your ability to consume them and migrate to them and, and get them as part of your, your architecture and what you deliver to your consumers it becomes faster. So your, your time to realize value of these new features and capabilities is, is quicker because you're not having to make any fundamental changes in and how that new feature or capability is consumed, right? It's still able to be presented up to the VASA provider and be made part of policies in SPDM framework, and then assigned accordingly, you know, to to be able to you know transition to that. So I mean, it's it's going to be, um, I think, fundamentally uh, easier to bring in these new capabilities and technologies as they continue to mature and become available. Right, and one of the speed ups right. to get there, Josh. One of the speed right, to get there, Josh, uh, is that uh, guys. One uh, thing I want to do is, is is circle back to that. Uh, just to go to the next topic. Trust me, I know there's a lot of depth to get into this. Um, next topic: architectural changes in the vaults. Um, in this case, lots of topic uh, around Vasa, lots of uh, lots of information on storage containers and PEs. Um, and so, with that, go to the next slide. So VASA provider, um, Ken, just to change it up a little bit, why don't you take us first through, give, give us your, your take on the VASA provider and, you know, where does this go? Uh, what I think is interesting here is how does this work from non vvols to vvols and what's so important about the VASA provider? I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about ones having traditionally to do a number of different um, factors, a number of different um, um, activities. So what the VASA provider is, is in essence the out-of-band management communication with the array that allows us first of all to discover what the capabilities are of the array. So that's the traditional VASA VMware APIs for storage awareness function to go out and query the arrays, but also to send down the commands. So if we're doing things like creating a new VVOL, uh, if we're doing things like um, doing a snapshot, any of those types of activities that we want that we're doing, we want to take that out of the, let's call it uh, data path and have a dedicated control path. So that's what the VASA provider is. It's a it's a secondary or an external location by which we can communicate with the arrays to do things like discover what the location of a particular VVOL is, to do any of the uh, bi-directional management type actions that we would normally want to do. So all of the control aspects of VVOLs take place through the VASA provider. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Other people can add color. So, I mean, if you're familiar with VASA, then we've got you know various iterations of the, the VASA API that we're, we're we're progressing, and that's so fundamental to VVOLs that this is really how we control all of it. That's, uh, that's I'll, I'll, make one, I'll, I'll, make, I'll make one comment to that because everything else was perfect. Is uh, understand that VASA, the one used for VVOL is 2.0, which basically the big thing here is that it enables a two-way communication between the storage subsystem and then the vSphere framework. But that's how we're able to say, this is what the storage system has, and this is what the from the vSphere side, this is what I want to consume from what you have. 
That's what actually yeah. keeps this whole thing working. Right. I'm just going to point out. And let that me add to that because that's, that's almost perfect. But. <laughs> I, I was going to point out that that would ban because it's, it provides such a rich set of capabilities that it, and there's no way that you could actually provide all those capabilities with, in band with, uh, with a SCSI command set. Yep. So let's move on to the next one then, and we'll get into the uh, storage container. Next slide. I'm sorry, protocol endpoints. So let's talk about protocol endpoints. So I'll walk us through, uh, let's mix it up and have Andy start here. Uh, give us your perspective on protocol endpoints, what's the big deal? Okay, so uh, a protocol endpoint, so if we back up just a step and say, you know, with VVOLs, we've, we've taken all the things that used to be stored on a LUN, on an LU, and, you know, separated them out, so they're all now separate items. Well, if you need to have like a, a separate fuzzy session for each one of those VVOLs, you'd probably quickly run out of the limitations on most storage ways, and he would certainly run out of the limitations on an ESX server that can only address 256 uh, targets or LUs. So the, the idea behind the protocol endpoint is that you will have one session between an ESX server and a protocol endpoint on a storage system, and there will be multiple devolves uh, served by that protocol endpoint. So. Um, most storage systems, uh, SolidFire included, will certainly have more than one protocol endpoint uh, for the storage system. Um, nice. The, the idea with uh, is with SolidFire is that we'll have at least one protocol endpoint for SolidFire node, and uh, in in heavier configurations, probably more. Uh, but the protocol endpoint is just the the termination point on the storage system that ESX talks to to find any number of uh, VVOLs. And we'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, VVOLs can migrate from one PE to another uh, to, you know, you have one PE that's overloaded. Uh, that would be the equivalent of doing with a storage VMotion today, only it happens entirely behind the scenes and there's no data movement that happens. It's just that the VVOL gets hooked up to a different protocol endpoint. All right, anybody have any questions on that? Otherwise, we will move to the next topic, which should be storage containers. Next slide. Yeah, storage containers. Uh, Josh, what, what do you see here? What do you want to talk about? Uh, so especially specific to uh, maybe starting to leak in a little bit of solid fire since we've got the, that array in there. What, uh, what's important about, uh, about storage containers here? Well, I think the, the primary thing around storage containers uh, alludes to what Andy was talking about and, and how we move forward with delivering the capabilities of the storage uh, up to like the SXI host, right? Leveraging you know, the protocol endpoints means that as additional virtual volumes are added inside of a storage container, it's automatically going to be accessible everywhere that that storage container is accessible, right? So it, you're, you're no longer having to deal with that, you know, as the customer I talked to earlier talked about, being able to have that storage container, you know, means that you're not having to provision new ones and then reconnect them and figure out the pathing on those and getting them assigned to SPs. And so with SolidFire, you know, we can put our storage containers right on top and we can have multiple, right? Uh, and I could let Andy speak to the, the details on something like that, but um, but gives you even more capabilities for granularity and how that you're delivering that storage and how you can deliver it to specific locations um, or, you know, uh, being able to say that once a storage container is connected and it's set up initially, it's, it's a lot easier to continue to grow and expand. Yeah, well... And I'll point out that, uh, you know, if we want to leak more solid fire concepts into this, the, a storage container is entirely a logical construct for solid fire. Uh, a storage container can contain as many or as few VVOLs as you want. Uh, you, you can either assign properties to a storage container or not. You can simply have the policies and, and properties apply to just the VVOLs, and the storage container can just be, you know, where they reside. Uh, without adding any capabilities associated with a storage container. A storage container is, you know, is limited by the size of your, your solid fire array or cluster. Uh, there's no size capability or 
anything else associated with a storage container in our case. It, it's purely a, a logical view of what vvols are there. And going back to the previous idea, it's the way a VM administrator, a vSphere administrator sees the vvol. So they, they will appear to be a storage container on the storage side will appear to be a data store in the, the vSphere uh, administration window. So it's entirely for logic approval. All right, so uh, moving on to the next topic. Next slide, please. Topic number four, how are vvols consumed? Uh, this is a super huge thing because, you know, there's not just an architectural shift, uh, a persona shift in terms of how a storage or, or a, v, a VM admin would operate, would utilize these capabilities and try to achieve some automation, but you know, how does this work for in terms of you know, some of the operating models like new deployments or, or migrating to vvols? Uh, I'm going to go next slide. Uh, in this model, we show a couple of different screenshots. On the left are a couple of uh, graphs from a web vSphere client. On the right is something from our vRealize uh, automation tech preview that we had at, at Partner Exchange. Uh, this shows some profound differences in what you can do from a new deployment model, whether you're doing it from a vSphere perspective or if you float up into some vRealize uh, automation type of operations. Uh, maybe Josh, why don't you walk us through a little bit of that? No and Josh, if you're, if you're on mute, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, no surprise. My mute button was broken. <laughs> um, right. So, you know, as we've alluded to um, previously, you know, with with deployment with vvols, you know, this, the administrators are able to create those policies based on the things that the storage system has presented us, those capabilities. Those policies are then made available so that when the consumer goes to deploy a virtual machine, whether it's through virtual center server or through, you know, a, a higher element like vRealize automation, you know, they have the opportunity then to define those policies for each disk, you know, for each vvol, right, and be able to, you know, dictate the very specific nature of performance or capability that each one of those virtual volumes is going to require. Um, and so from a deployment standpoint, it's, it's going to be more than just, you know, I'm going to deploy out of the MVK and I pick a data store and the check being, does this data store have enough capacity for what I'm wanting to do? Right now, the check becomes: I wanted to deploy out on this policy, and the policy then says, "Okay, does the storage, you know, meet the capabilities that are required in the policy?" Yes, it does, and, and it's able to deploy out. So, um, it's it's not that there's necessarily more um, effort required from a consumer. It's that you know they can be much more thoughtful and deliberate in how they're deploying, and be less concerned about the naming convention of a data store and more concerned about the policies that are presented and made capable to them. All right, excellent. Um, let's move on to the next slide real quick. All right, excellent. Ooh, so here, here we go. Now, now we get to have some fun because nothing happens overnight, and maybe it, maybe it shouldn't. Maybe you have a dual environment for a long time, but you're really looking at a non vvols to a vvols environment. I, you know, the unifying, uh, there's a few unifying factors, like, you know, if you're, you gotta be on vSphere 6 to be able to have both, right? You can't do it on 5.5 or previous versions. Therefore, your VASA provider should be 2.0. Um, therefore, you're, you, you should be using some storage-based policy management, SPBM, and working through those things. Um, Rollinson, this would be a good spot maybe for you to jump in and give us a little talk through uh, some of the architectural nuances in, in moving from a non vvols to a vvols environment. Cool. So I'll try to make it as concise and as short as possible. <clears throat> so obviously, as Pete said, we're not just going to jump on this whole vvol thing overnight. That's not happening. Uh, but what you want to do here and how you do it is basically when your array becomes or your whichever array you have, specifically your solid fire in this case, is vvol compliant, you will have the ability not to just use vvol. You, you will also continue to use and leverage uh, the, the, the previous implementations that they have, such as volume and assess, 
block space, whatever, whatever have you. Now the deal is this, you may be able to transition over to a new container, right, and basically do storage the motion. Uh, in that case, that lets you go seamlessly. There's no conversion, no change, seamlessly. You basically do what you've been doing in the past, storage free motion from one type of uh, volume lunch slash container into a VMO capable of container, and the system will just adjust to that. Um, uh, that can happen a couple of different ways. Either you do that manually or you do that through a, you know, the sort of uh, integration piece that you saw with the realized before. The whole point is that um, you don't necessarily have to, depending on the implementations, do a storage free motion. There might be uh, different ways which vendors will imp implement it differently where they would take uh, uh, control of the metadata changes that could happen so that you basically just, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of turn that sort of object particularly into this new format, but obviously those are implementation details. So the whole point is this. Um, you can leverage uh, some of the either VAI or the new primitives that are available within the framework to do so, and then you'll be offloading some of the, uh, some of the provisioning and management capabilities depending on what the array supports. Right? So we, we're dealing with different capabilities from, a, from an API perspective, different primitives to do different things, but overall, you can do this seamlessly at any point in time. You don't have to go all in or nothing. You can do this gradually uh, as, you see, as, as it fits your infrastructure. Um, and it's, it, you can't really tell the difference uh, in terms of going from one to another. Excellent. A um, lot to get into there. Um, there's also been a number of blogs, uh, Ralph, you've got one uh, related to some operations with VVOLs and, and some things we talk about VAI and other things. So uh, there will be lots of opportunities in places that uh, not only SolidFire but also VMware will be exposing for white papers, blogs, and information about how to move uh, from non devolves to devolves and how to operate with both. Uh, next slide. All right, last topic. Um, and this is really just a, kind of a glimpse of the future. Uh, SolidFire is bringing forward a devolves implementation on our solution. We're a, we're a scale out shared nothing solution. If you could go to the next slide. In, in the uh, scale, in, in our implementation, in our in our solution, there's a bunch of base attributes of our architecture that you know we could leverage. If uh, as you look at some of the uh, exposed capabilities uh, on the left hand side, you've got the legacy versus the right-hand side showing solid fire. Uh, you know, this is a, a really good nuance. Um, maybe, uh, Josh, if you could walk us through what we see here as a, as a contrast. Yeah, I think primarily what you're looking at is that the transition from, you know, this platform is very rigid in what it delivers where a lot of the performance balancing and things may happen on the back end where you know, the disk type and the RAID groups that are presented limit you to very specific performance profiles. And then, you know, the, the transpose to that would be SolidFire where, you know, each virtual volume gets to define um, or in each policy gets to be very granularly defined to be exactly what's required. So, you know, having the ability to have a unique policy for a MongoDB um, database disk versus an operating system disk versus you know, an application install disk, a web disk, a log disk, you know, all of these different workload types that we have, um, you know, the, the real difference is being able to define policies that are very unique and specific to that uh, application you know, workload profile and being able to do it not only to that application but what your application needs. Right? It's not just a generic, you know, um, SQL database disk that, you know, you have to have the same thing as, you know, anybody else. It gets to be very, very personal and granular to, you know, the needs of your consumers. Yeah, great point. And I think if we go to the last slide, I think that the big thing that we're really just showing is that, you know, with, with a lot of legacy architectures, you've got to choose from harbor tiers to get performance management. You're, you're choosing from things like what RAID types do I need? And it, it, what we see in, in cloud-built data centers and service providers are not those things. You know, if we're looking for performance, 
and software controls on those things. RAID not only doesn't scale, but there's, there's issues with that in, in service provider and cloud scenarios. You see that all over the place. You see an ability with us with, with guaranteed QoS to have ability to set minimums, maximums, and bursts. What we intend to deliver with VVOLs is something that we think will go uh, well beyond where we're at in the VVOLs uh, community today. Uh, we'll intend to show lots of feature functionality. You've seen that in our tech previews. Um, we've got that on YouTube. Um, and if you look at what we're trying to deliver, it's, it's exposed capabilities. And when we're talking exposed capabilities, it's not just capacity. It's also performance attribute. It's things like encryption, yes or no. You know, it's, it's, it's replication, snapshots, all the, all the data services and data feature sets that you need to have to not only build applications, but build VMs and scale up and automate. Uh, next slide. So move on to the next slide real quick. We'll, uh, as you guys look through the, the questions, I just want to give a summary set of takeaways and then just have one lap around the, the table with the panelists. You know, to me, this was some of the takeaways I thought. You know, VVOLS, as much as it seems like it's about storage, it's really about automation, and specifically storage automation. And it's something that you can actually do without VVOLS today. That's point number four. Um, if you look at VVOLS, it's also about IT consumption. You know, this starts to get into the pathway of, you know, the self-service portal and the ability for different parts of IT to consume IT infrastructure without you having to manually provision and do a bunch of arduous steps. Um, VVOLS in Rev1 is a, has Rev1 limitations. We talk about that with replication and other things. So look for VVOLS to be an iterative process. And then uh, lastly, I think, you know, what we've talked about to this point from a solid fire perspective is we intend to deliver things that we think will matter, not just performance management. That's obviously very important. And you want to have those, those knobs and dials to control performance on your VMs, on your workloads, uh, and mix the workloads. So you can have um, all workloads uh, combined in one architecture rather than having to have a separate SANS with EDI as an example or a separate SANS with Oracle or enterprise applications. Um, consolidate those all together and then scale and integrate the automation. Um, so with that, I want to say thanks to uh, the, the crew we have here at the Oklahoma City VMUG. Uh, you guys have been awesome. I don't know if you want to give our panel a round of applause. I'd love to hear some from the, the gang here. Let me hear it. Someone drop a mic for me, please. Yes. <laughs> yes. Relative wants a mic drop somewhere, so I don't know if we want to pay for that one. Uh, I want for to the hear panel. From the panelists, one, one, lap, one lap around the table. Give us your, your closing takes, and then if there's any questions in the queue, um, let's have those fielded. Um, otherwise, I think we're up against the clock. I'll, I'll close it in with this. Um, obviously, again, technology. Uh, VVOLS delivers with every technology that's released from us, from anybody. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, we, we have a starting point. The value is there. Uh, they, there are some, a couple of limitations, but let me uh, ask everyone to sort of Sorry. the biggest, the biggest change with virtual volume is going to be influencing and changing the operating model. You want to start kind of at least getting your hands uh, on this so that you can understand and see how this will change how you consume, manage, and administer storage in the future. Moving forward, within a few months, trust me, we'll be we'll be ready with just about everything we need to have to make it. Um, the way you need it, but start with the education process. This is different. There's a different concepts, different people involved, different things, and that's the one thing that's probably harder to absorb or consume than the actual technology changes itself. Mike, drop. <laughs> Completely agree, Ken. Here, um, I think it, it, it's one of the biggest changes in storage. One of the most intrusive, non-intrusive changes we've seen. Uh, it, it's changing the way people interact with storage, not necessarily delivering a new and weird way of doing things. So it's, it's a really amazing change that we're going to see going, uh, going forward in the next couple of months. But I think also one of the other cool things is that it's a new way to interact with the value of those capabilities of the, of the arrays. So it, it's a pretty huge change all around. I think the unique value that our partners such as Solifier have uh, can now be presented better than ever to individual VMs, and that's a pretty amazing thing. Right, and uh, Andy here, uh, just to, to close things out on my side, 
um, you know, the, the whole idea is to uh, make better use of the resources that you have. And as I mentioned, a couple of the most valuable resources are both your ESX compute resources and your uh, your SAN bandwidth resources. And, and Vvolt is going to make better use of both of those. And uh, I'll also uh, say that if you want to find more uh, about this, uh, make sure that you vote for uh, the advanced Vvolt configuration session that Ken and I are planning on presenting at VMworld. Clever, uh, last, last but not least, I'll throw in, you know, from a management orchestration and automation standpoint, uh, be prepared to see a lot of new flexibility and capabilities um, that are going to enable organizations to, to implement and manage VVOLs and, and then provide much you know, greater granularity and control uh, while also reducing a lot of risk. Excellent. Thanks, panelists. Um, and the folks here at the Oklahoma City VMUG appreciate yours, uh, your comments and your insights on this topic. Any questions um, from the chat line? Woohoo! Go KC, go Kevin Durant. <laughs> and with that, then, um, I think we're concluded. I want to thank everyone for attending both the uh, webinar side of this as well as the folks in the Oklahoma City VMUG for attending via the live, live stream. Uh, with that, uh, thanks and. Go be balls. <laughs>